you uh, towards the end, you know, to do a little bit of a process just so that you have a little example of how it works, right? So as I said, the somatic Enneagram is the missing piece of the Enneagram work, especially if you want to delve deeper down under the story of yourself and the world around you and the perceptions that we have created in beliefs and certain ideas and certain emotional, you know, um, ways that we are defending ourselves about getting hurt in our hearts. You know, if you look underneath that, there is a somatically based foundational aspect of how we split ourselves into opposing parts. Yeah. And that is necessary to do in order for us to survive in the body in this world. Yeah. They are necessary. They, you can't, it's not about getting rid of them, it's learning to understand them in what they are attempting to do. And if it's congruent with the current moment. Yeah. So that is where we're going to work and understand that our patterns are running us most of the time based on what we per perceive or anticipate is going to hurt us next. Yeah. This is huge, huge discovery. So we are keeping the pattern automatically going all day long, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, based on the fact that once upon a time in the past, we got really overwhelmed in our nervous system when we were quite young. Sometimes it's in the womb. Sometimes it's through a birthing process. Sometimes it's in the first three years of life when we have no access to cognitive memory, none. It's just fairly starting because we cannot even say the word I, right? So our nervous system is already set on the tracks of certain ways that we believe we have to organize ourselves in ways of who we need to be and what we need to avoid uh, early on before we even know what's happening. Yeah. And that is emotion of that is somatic intelligence. Yeah. If we didn't have these defense mechanisms already activating from the moment of conception through our whole time in the womb, through the birthing process, through the first three years of life, we would not survive. Yeah. So that's how intelligent the somatic, you know, organization needs to be in order for us to have a life long enough so that we can get to the full development of our brain capacity at about 24 years old, where the prefrontal cortex is finally fully developed. This is huge, right? Because we need to do that ego development in the way that we need to do it that creates and solidifies your pattern. There's no way around it. Without it, we won't be able to really get even to the ripe age of 24. <laughs> so your real process starts at age 24. Doesn't mean you cannot have certain, you know, understandings of yourself before that. But the prefrontal cortex in the brain is the newest development of the neocortex, it allows us as human mammals to reflect on our lives. That's what it does for us. Yeah. Before that, we don't have capacity for reflection and observation. So that is necessary for us to understand before we even begin to work with the somatic aspect of ourselves. Because the somatic Enneagram is not do a few exercises and you will be well and all is well. That's not how it works. It, it's a deep inner observer based process of placing our attention inside of ourselves via the felt sense lens of perception. What does that mean? Felt sense. Well, felt sense is something very uncommon in our cultures, especially the first world cu cultures that we have gone away by over celebrating the neocortex and really avoiding or trying to hide the somatic brain in the back. 
yeah, instincts and all of that is not really acceptable behavior is what we the messages that we've been getting and the schooling that we get is all over celebrating the neocortex yeah what do you do for a living yeah what school did you go to yeah what kind of credentials do you have well how much money do you have in the bank those are the questions that we are getting as adults and it's like don't you know who i am don't you want to know who I am and what I care about, well, that comes secondary. And then it's like, you know, okay, but who are you in your being? You know, how are you? How do you stand and live and be in this world? How's that affecting you? Yeah, is the question of the somatic Enneagram. And that is not being highlighted. And I'm bringing this back from the indigenous cultures who use, you know, somatic intelligence as their primary way to move through the world. They knew how to be. They knew how to be present. They knew how to be grounded. They knew how to have somatic intelligence in the way that they knew where to go and to get to the water that they needed or to the food that they had to have. Or they knew how to sit in the circle around the fire, yeah, in order to tell the stories so that they can all join in together. They knew how important it was that we are together in this work and in this life. There's no such thing as one person taking care of themselves, which of course in the United States is a big issue. Yeah, we call it the white picket fence syndrome. And I don't know if you know, but originally I'm from Holland. So I wasn't, I wasn't conditioned in that way. I've learned how to work with it. Of course, it has certain advantages also, but I won't go into that. But that whole survival thing, you know, that is actually driving your reactivity of your type structure all the way from the belly center up through the heart into the beliefs, you know, needs to be understood because that's the fuel of your reactive behavior that automatically gets activated without you even knowing it's doing it. Yeah, so you can can do all the mental work and that's great. You can do all the emotional work, that's great. But without dropping it all the way down into the belly, you know, and understanding where that particular reactivity gets fueled that is actually unwanted behavior, even by you. And then you use the super, super ego, ego to, you know, to really kind of chastise, chastise yourself for having once again lost control or whatever, it is the way that it kind of keeps circulating from, you know, the, the heart center to the head center, but not, not really drop down into the belly center with curiosity of an inner observer that is objective, that is just simply noticing, that is simply, you know, tracking, you know, what is happening in the body while this reactivity is actually going on and the, the lens of perception that gives you access to the belly center is the felt sense it's the sensations in your body it's not the emotions it's not the thoughts it's not the plans it's not the imagination and it is also not the memories the cognitive memories however in the somatic world that i've you know trained in there is also something called cellular memories, yeah, somatically based memories that actually have been tracking your life from the moment of conception on. Yeah, that's how your brain developed and adapted and needed to adapt and needed to protect certain aspects of your development for you to be good enough alive. Yeah, so good enough alive is what we are. And we don't know that there's parts of our body in this particular moment, you know, that are contracted and not available to you. We don't know that because, you know, the defense system actually keeps it away from you. 
So the somatic enneagram is going into all the specific type specific ways in which that original split began between what I'm attracted to and what I want, where I want to move towards. This is what I want to experience and what you averted away from or what you don't want or you want to avoid like the plague. Yeah, those two become separated into two aspects of yourself in the somatic structure of your type. This is not happening in your mind only. This is not only happening in your heart. This is originating, the original split is originating into your somatically based early nervous system tracks that were being laid in connection to particular brain fields and what comes onto your screen of awareness. And that is powerful if you just think about that for a few minutes. So again, we do work with pain in the body, but pain is only the very tip of the iceberg of your somatic organization. Pain, when you get to the level of pain in your body, your body has been trying to signal to you, hey, oh, come back over here with small little twinges, small little, you know, whatever to try to get your attention, that something was needed down below the belt in the catacombs of your being, yeah? Something is needed. So the basically the somatic Enneagram work is, is to, to use body intelligence to relax your type structure, not your personality. The personality will follow. There is a type structure that needs to relax so that your mind can open and your heart can become undefended. Unless that happens in the belly, forget it. You can do all the emoting that you want to do. It's not going to relieve it unless you find a way to become present to the original pain in your heart. Yeah? Yeah. Also with the mind, when it gets fixated in belie into beliefs, you know, you can do all kinds of mental agility exercises and they can be helpful. But unless, you know, you have access to where those fixated beliefs originated in from a survival point of view, you won't be able to fully relax you know, that particular part of your pattern. And the fuel will, will keep coming up and fueling into the contraction against certain aspects of your life and your world you live in. Okay. So I just want to stop right here for a minute because I threw already a lot at you. That is not very commonplace conversation. Is Are there any kind of questions about what I just said or do you understand what I'm saying or am I completely out in in left field for you which is fine there's no such thing as a dumb question I love questions so please if you want you can either raise your hand on the screen or you can go to the um to the reactions down below in the bottom and it says raise hand yeah, I, I will demonstrate that. So I'm I'm raising my hand. Do you see? I'm going up here and I have a little raised hand in the corner. And then you can also lower your hand when you're done. So what would you, any kind of feedback? Do you understand this? Is it really not computing yet? Yes, please, Lars. You can unmute yourself. Uh, when you're talking about uh, the belly, I, I must confess I've been clean and sober for 33 uh, years through Trusted Programs. Good job. And I've worked with uh, almost every Trusted Program. But w w sometimes in my recovery, I, in, in AA, I ask to be the short story. I ask, what, what is in your belly? May I point your finger and then up? Say, oh, last one, what the hell are you doing? It's hurting. 
oh dear, another one, and another one, and another one. So I think maybe there is a pattern. And when uh, uh, asking further into the, the phenomena, it, it uh, showed up that, that the hole was filled out when they get the substance of John was it coked up or whatever. I said, oh, I'm home now. Yeah. So that that's uh, uh, why I think it's very important to know the centers or even the seven chakras or whatever model you're working from to get them lined up and balanced. Exactly. And that balancing is a really difficult thing to do if you don't realize how you can connect and be present to these pains that are coming up once you place your attention there and you have no method that you can use to stay with them because they are overwhelming you as a, as a possibility. Yeah. So I'm so glad to hear that you found some some way to be present to them. Yes, actually, the solution is quite simple. When I'm working with people, I ask them to hold, hold their hand out. And this part of you who belongs there, let, let that come forward in your hand and then take it in. And they do it like this. And then <laughs> something happens. So what was it gone? Oh, it's inside now. OK, it's job done. <laughs> That's beautiful. And I've, and I've done it so many times. It's, it's, it's is tailor-made for each person. Yes, it's very different for each person, even though there's some type specific ways in what may be, how it shows up and what may be important to look at. So from that place that you're describing, you know, to be able to support it and then accept it in, yeah? Receive it, right? You know, there is a whole process that we can use to breathe around it. I use the breath a lot to breathe around it once it's inside and let it know it's welcome, right? Let it know it's welcome. And then to maybe once you're able to not be overwhelmed by whatever that pain is, to give it a voice and let it speak to you. And that may also be a really beautiful way in order for you to create that inner relationship of su mutual support to each other. So thank you for sharing that. I'm so happy that you have found all these ways to be with yourself and, and recreate your he health and balance, you know? Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. So let me go on a little bit with, you know, explaining the method. Okay, the method didn't just fall from the sky because without a method to really learn how to be present to something that you categorically avoid to get in touch with, and that you are instinctually pushed away from, you know, requires a counter instinctual movement towards that what you don't want to feel. And that is a choice. Okay. It's not an easy choice because a lot of people say, why would I want to do that? I'm fine without having to do that. Well, why would you want to do that? Is because a part of you is suffering, a part of you is in pain. Yeah. And a lot of times you don't know that it's even there. And then once you get in closer or get in touch with it, there is a need for the inner observer to have some kind of a sense of how to make space for that which you don't want to feel inside of yourself. And I, like I said to Lars, we are working a lot with the breath, breathing towards the place of where that pain is actually occurring. The word where is the, is the key, not how or what or why, but where is it happening is the main question. And it's amazing when you say, where is this happening? It's such an unfamiliar way to go inside. But yet once you start building those neuro pathways into the where, 
it becomes actually at a certain point it becomes second nature to include that and then if it overwhelms your nervous system and the way that you know that is by the revving up of your sympathetic nervous system yeah the sympathetic nervous system is the autonomic nervous system that is in charge when you know danger and survival is at stake yeah it will automatically fuel yeah and the way the defensive reflexes work is fight, flight, and freeze. Yeah. Three ways in which the nervous system begins to react against and moves away from or makes itself invisible and dissociates from the particular place where it's happening. So it's very important for us to know that the, that belongs to the belly center. Yeah. And we may already be getting, if there's three defensive reflexes and there's three centers, that's not necessarily by accident, yeah? Because what would you say the fight reflex belongs to, yeah? Do you have any idea what emotion belongs to the fight reflex? Anybody? Anger. Anger. Yeah, so anger and fight, they belong together. Anger is in the heart, it's an emotion. The fight reflex is in the belly. It's innate, automatic, and it will operate whether you give permission to it or not. And that's also a really good thing, right? Because if you have to think about saving ourselves and we're in a car accident, forget it, you're dead, right? The reflexes are really important. Okay, so we are working with the reflexes in the somatic enneagram, and the belly center is connected to anger. Are you guys all familiar with that? The driving emotion for the belly center is anger. So the eight, nines, and ones in three different ways are preferring the fight reflex. Yeah, doesn't mean they don't have access to the other two, but there is a primary reflex in it that begins to operate in order to protect oneself. And I'm not going to go into the whole teaching and the detail of that because that's what I'm going to do in January. But I want you to kind of get the, the relationship between it. So what do you think the, the emotion is that belongs to the flight reflex? Anybody? Yes, Martin. You want to say something? I saw you reach forward. <laughs> fear. Yes, fear. Very good. So flight and fear are connected. So they are in the head center. The driving emotion for the head center types is fear. Yeah. And the flight is in three different ways, part of the inner movement of the head center. I'm not talking about externally visible. I'm talking about the inner movements here, yeah? And then we have only one left, right? It's the freeze response, yes? So what core emotion would, would be part of that? Who would use freeze and dissociation? And what is it trying to control or hide? What is the driving emotion? Go ahead. Anybody? Yeah, there's only hurt. hurt, yes, hurt. And when you're hurting, what happens? What is the emotion that arises? Sadness. Sadness, yeah. Sadness at the loss of contact, very specific sadness, yeah? It's my grief and my sadness about losing the contact with somebody that I care about, yeah? So it's hurt, pain, yeah? It's, it's all of that, but it's connected to grief at the loss of contact, yeah? And so if you are concerned about losing the contact, would it make sense for you to fight that person? Not really, huh? Because what would happen if you fight the person that you care about and you're scared to lose the contact with? Yeah, 
the other person might push you away. Yeah, they don't want to be around you. That's a possibility when you get angry with that person. So, you know, it's not a very great way to reach for that particular reflex. And the same with flight. Yeah, if you run away from the person that you care about and you want to maintain the connection, yeah, and you're running away, you're losing the connection. So, you know, the freeze is making myself invisible. Yeah, I'm dissociating from the pain in my heart so that I can stay connected with the other person. So even all the heart types that are, you know, attempting to be caring and attempting to be kind and attempting to move towards people, a lot of them are already kind of partially gone in their own heart. Yeah, because they are, they're in a freeze, freeze response. So these three reflexes are key towards, you know, the particular vice and virtue and also the fixation and the holy idea. Now, of course, in the belly, we don't only have contracted or defensive reflexes. We also have, you know, the nurturing or the exploration reflexes. Yeah. And the ones that... I have discovered that are sort of the antidote or the relaxation of the particular defensive reflex is play, curiosity, and, you know, seeking contact. Seeking contact is a reflex. If you have a little baby just born, it crawls up to the mother's breast and begins to suckle. Yeah, it's a reflex. It will actually happen if you let the baby do that even though they just born, yeah? Seeking contact is a natural, relaxed, open-hearted stance for a human being to want to connect with another human being, yes? And when that somehow feels threatening, that we learn part of our heart is kept into a freeze hold, yeah? Very important to see that seeking contact is the relaxation of the freeze. And the way that happens is the freeze goes into the collapse and the melt, and then it goes into seeking contact, yes? So for the fight reflex, when it begins to relax and it be begins to complete itself, if it's allowed to move, which often we don't allow it to move, but if it's allowed to move, it will turn into play. Yeah, you see little children doing that on the continuum of fighting and playing with each other all the time. And they have access to both sides almost simultaneously, right? We as adults, not so much. Once we get angry, we hold grudges, we go resentful, and we can hold on to that for a very long time before we kind of, in a playful way, you know, kind of connect again with that person from a place of being playful, right? And then for the flight reflex, the relaxation of the flight is a little person that runs away from whatever it is afraid of and hide behind the mother's skirt and stays there until somehow the safety will calm down the nervous system. And then it will look from behind mother's skirt to see what's going on there because curiosity is a natural and wanting to be wanting to participate and wanting to you know be part of is a natural way for the child to want to return yeah and we also lose that as adults curiosity for something that we feel is better to not go towards uh, you know, and we have learned to move away from it by our adaptive strateg strategies of our type, you know, it's cementing the whole thing in to not really go back to these nourishing reflexes, those exploration reflexes that are also available in the somatic part of your brain and the spinal cord and the physicality of your being. Yeah. You won't be able to just tell a, a, a child that 
you know, just got beaten up, you know, go, go and play with your friends, you know, just don't bother me, go play with your friends. Of course, you're not going to do that. Yeah. If you don't have the support from mother and you you get a certain acknowledgement and the mother helps you go back to the child that hurt you and let let something occur between the two to where it can become resolved and it's safe again. Yeah, so that is the important here of co-regulation, self-regulation of the nervous system. If it stays revved up, your nervous, your nervous system will not become available to receive any kind of other input. It will stay in a reactive state. So to ask people to receive something when they're in full tilt in their autonomic nervous system, it's not going to happen. So in the somatic Enneagram, we're using these trauma resolution theories and principles for normal, healthy human behavior. Yeah, so this is not trauma, even though it's trauma related. It, this is actually a balancing of the nervous system that Stephen Porges and, you know, the polyvagal theory, as well as Stephen, Le, uh, not Stephen, Peter Levine with his trauma resolution, you know, teaching. Uh, and he says the same thing. You know, he says, it's not meant to be therapized. I mean, yes, you can include it into your therapeutic skills. It's meant for human beings to be able to learn how to live freer lives and healthier lives and deal with some normal addictive patterns because alcoholism is only a small portion of how we are addicted to our patterns yeah we're addicted to our parent patterns and alcoholism is just one small expression of that and it's very important to know that we are addicted to staying away from what we don't want to feel and we are wanting to push ourselves into the places where it feels safe enough good enough comfortable enough not free but comfortable enough and that is running our you know all of all three of our centers and that's why the somatic Enneagram is really the missing piece because until you drop all the way down and understand how the revving up of your sympathetic nervous system when you not only where when you're under threat but when you perceive threat the same cascade of autonomic nervous system reactions happens or when you anticipate threat which is all the time according to our Enneagram way of looking at life. And in the narrative, we really have uh, now integrated some of that because when I was there and I worked with Helen Palmer and uh, David Daniels, as well as Peter and Terry, I was able to get the permission to start experimenting with working with this somatic stuff and then at a certain point i wanted to sort of do my own teaching because you know at some point you just want to teach what you te want to teach <laughs> and they don't want to go as far as i believe we can go as human beings to free ourselves <laughs> i want to build more capacity because it really is not it's not something that that uh, you need to intellectually understand. You don't even have to have an, an a way to have emotional understanding of yourself. You can easily read your body's cues. Once you turn on your somatic lens of perception, which is the, the lens of sensation, so the moment you use your lens of sensate and where is it in my body, you are in the belly center and, and the, the intelligence that's there. So you can have a somatic experience of your head, of your heart, of your limbs, of your belly. You can have that. You know, nobody understands that. But 
you know, to ask your your head, where is it happening in your head? You know, if you are in a head panel, you know, say, well, I feel it in my head. I have to learn how to get out of my head. I said, no, your head is part of your body. It belongs, but it's a different lens of perception that we're going to use. And you get a different kind of information based on you choosing a different lens of perception. Yes. So disorganization and filling in that belly center and then learning how to be with it and learning how the balancing of that autonomic nervous system needs to happen in order for you to experience that safety with the part of you that you don't want to feel and have now judged as being and labeled as being unsafe within you is the beginning of freeing your inner territory and your inner landscape and understanding how to have access now to receptivity because there is, there is now an opening, opening and a spaciousness that is becoming available to you either in your head center or in your heart center to where it doesn't matter if you don't know, right? It really doesn't matter. Don't know is the requirement for curiosity. Yeah, if you, if you think you know it all and you hold on to what you know, then you're closing yourself off and feeling afraid of what you don't know because something bad can happen. That is belly-centered information, you know, moved up to the head center. And that's so important without us understanding why fear lies in the head. It is because it is the, the flight of the away from the belly translated upwards into the neocortex in three different ways in five, six, and seven that will take you away from where the fear is generated and where the flight is generated. It's in the belly. Yeah, so fight, flight, and freeze happen in the belly. And it will determine what the automatic displacement and the automatic placement of attention will be according to each type and according to each center. So we are going to play with that. We're going to create curiosity in relationship to finding a way to be present to what we don't know. And we will come to treasure it as now committing to be an eternal student of life. Yeah, without that, you won't you won't learn anything new if you keep reinforcing what you think you know and nothing else is being explored, right? And we know all that five, six, and seven have that fear of and want to avoid the unknown in each particular way. And in each particular way, we're going to explore how they do that energetically and how can we stay present with that, okay? In three different way, ways, we stop seeking contact, yeah? How many of you during COVID, especially when we could not reach out, you know, we're not feeling very strange in the beginning when the bands were lifted, you know, to hug a person again and oh can I is this person safe to hug is that person safe to hug do they wear a mask is all that yeah it's huge belly centered distorted you know circumstances and the heart suffers yeah the heart suffers because we don't get to be close to people we don't get to be intimate we don't get to you know, be in, in a place together and, you know, share our, our lives and our stories and our feelings. So we stop seeking, you know, that gets interrupted, that gets stunted. The seeking reflex needs to be reactivated. Yeah, it can only be reactivated if we learn how to be with the grief of the loss of contact that is overwhelming or the way that we were abandoned or rejected or disapproved of, right? Which happens in the two, three, and four. 
right? So to work with the wound energetically is very different than working with it cognitively or emotionally. And this is what the promise is of the somatic Enneagram world. And it's a game changer. I cannot tell you how much anybody off the street I can sit down and be with knowing what I know. And it's not rocket science. Anybody needs to know this. Anybody, when, once they know it, can show up for another human being energetically and don't have to get all contracted inside and you know, feel awkward and feel like shame that embarrassed that they can't do anything or know anything. You can work with these very deeply uncomfortable somatic experiences and neutralize them by balancing them through the resourcing and through the felt sense that always is available inside of you at any point, no matter how overwhelmed you feel. Yeah, this is possible. And the same for the belly center with the anger and the fight. Yeah. If we don't have a way to release and relax that anger and energetically allow the energy of the anger to flow through us rather than projecting it outward to, to the people around us and we get extricated and, you know, exercise of particular groups because you know people don't want to be around us any longer and it feeds the wound yeah i don't belong i never belonged i don't know how to belong and i lose my playfulness in the process so those are repeated patterns that are totally conditioned, deeply conditioned into the neural pathways, into specific brain fields that are getting reignited over and over again so that the myelination of these neural pathways will determine which impression and reaction to that impression will reach what brain field first. Yeah, so we need to change the wiring. We need to learn how to resource and choose to resource so that another brain field that is a balancing of the other brain field is as myelinated and is as easily and, in, and equally available at the same time. And that is a process that I can teach you. And I can do it with or without the Enneagram, which is also lovely. I knew this stuff before I was working with this stuff before the Enneagram. But when I met the Enneagram, it's like, what a wonderful way that we have this map and we have these nine patterns and these three centers. We have these three defensive reflexes and no, the fawn reflex is not a part of that particular. The fawn reflex is a secondary uh, reflex that is an adaptive way in which we learn how to reconnect from an energetic point of view yeah and i will also go into that so this is about using foundational elements first without the foundational elements you cannot do this process so it requires that people have already come to a point in their lives that they're willing to take 100% responsibility for themselves and for their own reactions. Yeah, that's huge. No, it's not your father. It's not your mother. It's not, you know, the culture. It's not, you know, the ancestry. Yes, that influenced you. But you, at a certain point in your life, you need to be willing to take 100% responsibility for your life and all the influences that made up you, yeah? For that, we need an inner observer practice that is a meditative practice that is objective, and you're learning how to turn your attention inward. You're learning that there is an inner landscape, an inner territory that you can learn how to fill in and learn to understand, and it's the last frontier, yeah? So important to... 
that we are all through the modules strengthening and cultivating the inner observer attention. As always objective, it's never hardwired in the type structure and it never will be automatic. It needs to be a conscious placement of attention. Yeah. And then the second part of the foundational elements that we need in order to do this work is that we are needing to learn how to ground and orient ourselves in the present moment of our lives, which is the only moment we have to live. Yeah, the past, the moment that is past is gone. Can't change that. The moment that's next is not here yet. We don't know that. We don't know what's going to be there next. This moment is your golden moment. And it's the only moment where you can observe, where you can understand, where you can have a choice to place your attention. And that is the only free choice we get in our lives. And it is a huge choice. Yeah, the only choice we have, and that's the third element, is placement of attention. It doesn't matter what's happening in your life and what situation you're in. You might not be able to do anything about it, but you have a choice where and how you're going to place your attention. That's huge. Because wherever you're going to place your attention, energy will follow, and that is what will come onto your screen of awareness. You have something to say about your experience yeah you have a choice to stay and get entrenched into your suffering or you can say oh i feel my suffering i'm going to make space for it but i'm going to choose first to balance myself by shifting my attention to a place that's not suffering the moment you do that your somatic brain reads that you're safe that you're alive and it begins to relax and the parasympathetic nervous system will start to come into being. It's amazing. You can try it out. And so far <laughs> in the last probably 20 years of my working life and working with my patients as well as teaching the Enneagram somatically, I've never had anybody who couldn't do it. Never. They said they couldn't do it, but with staying with them pretty soon, in a minute or two, they are able to do it. I just want to tell you, you do not have to continue to suffer. Yes, you're going to have to feel pain, but suffering is not a choice. Suffering will happen if you do not use your free choice. Until then, it's not a, until then, it's not a choice. You suffer. We all suffer. It's part of life. But with this method, you can shift the pain to just being the pain about something that you are making space for and not resist it. Because suffering is pain times resistance. Yeah, which the defense mechanism has automatically clamped up for you. Yeah. So in module one, we are going into the teaching you the three foundational elements and teaching you the felt sense awareness, the resourcing and the integration. Yeah, that is the basic method that we're going to do. And we're doing that according to the three centers. And we will have a panel of three centers that we're doing to give people a chance to experience that. And the panels are not necessarily part of every school, any Grimm school, but it's the school that I chose. I'm really happy I chose it because in that school, we believe that it's you that are the expert. You are the one that is living your life according to that type. And you are the one that needs to voice it in the way that you are experiencing it. Yeah. So it's my job to facilitate that, but not to be the teacher that tells you who you are and how you are and what you are. That's not my job. I'm a companion on your path. 
And that's very powerful because it makes it so that we're all kind of joining hands and walking each other home, right? And it's a beautiful place to share on the panel. That will be part of your experience. And I promise you that experience you won't ever forget because once you experience it in your body, it's there to stay. It's not one a fleeting moment, okay? So, and then the module two is working with this. You have a question, Karen? Sorry, I, sorry, Marion. I was just gonna ask you to just restate the, the quick process that you went through for module one. I didn't catch it and I'd like to kind of hold it. Thank you. Yes, so module one is actually the core module. Without it, you know, all the rest is built on it. Meaning the somatic Enneagram is consisting out of three foundational elements. Yeah, inner observer, grounded presence, and placement of attention. Yeah, we're gonna practice that. We're gonna take you there. Without these three elements, we cannot do the somatic work as conscious people. Yeah, this is not trauma-based, even though trauma might come up and that's okay. I'm just saying this is for your human development. Yeah, conscious awareness. And then the method that we are going to apply to really getting to the very core of your somatic structure of your type is that we're going to use the felt sense awareness. We're going to teach you that. We're going to res do resourcing or resources. We're going to teach you that, how to do that. And we're going to also teach you what integration looks like. Yeah, the, the integration is that balancing act between the felt sense that's contracted and painful and that part of your being that's already free. Yeah, so we're going to, by shifting attention, we're going to learn how to balance that. Yeah, so that consists out of module one. Once you come out of that with the panels, yeah, each one, it will get a turn to be on the panel in the body center, in the heart center, in the head center, you know, depending on what center you belong to as your type. And we do some demonstration and taking you inside and meeting you wherever you are. And then we have you feel what it's like to drop underneath with the method and with the foundational elements. And you can do that. It's a beautiful thing to do. And it's my, this is my commitment to you guys, is I will meet you where you are. You don't have to prepare. You don't have to know anything. I can do it with anybody off the street and I can be that, yeah? So you will have an experience. And even if you don't know, I'm not certain of your type, it's okay. As a matter of fact, it might actually help your type, or, you know, that will then arise from there. Okay. So the second module then will using that somatic awareness practice in relationship to the defense system. And the defense system is again, not being taught very much in the Enneagram world. We teach it in the Enneagram. That's the narrative Enneagram. And the defense system is a very important part that makes up your somatic type structure because it's based in the belly. Okay. And then, you know, again, we're doing the three centers panels in relationship to that. And we're going to work with the three elements of the defense system. Okay, there's three elements to the defense system. I don't want to go into it because it takes too much time. And then the third module that I'm going to do, and it's great to do these in person again because I've been doing it on Zoom, but I cannot tell you it's so much more um, powerful if we can do it in person, which is lovely that both Helena and um, Karina are offering this uh, to host this is going to be working with the avoidance of our type in relationship to the Enneagram of harmony and the essence of your type. 
Yes. So now we're getting even deeper. So each module will take you a little bit deeper and it, it builds on, on each other. So if we have these six days, it's almost like a retreat because each step we go in step by step and we're deepening the process. And we again do the three panels, but we do it according to the harmony triads. And I don't wanna go into that because it takes too much time and why we're doing that that way. So who would like to, of this group, if there are no other questions or if you have a questions, you can do that now. And otherwise, who would like of the group to do a little preview of a little bit of a, an, um, a little process, a somatic in inquiry process with me? And I will be there with you. I'm very happy to. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so, Karen, what is your type? Nine. Nine. Beautiful. Do you have a subtype that you I know? Think it's sexual. Sexual. Okay. Perfect. Mm. All right. So, what we would like to do. Um, is maybe you can make this happen for its uh, Helena is or Helena, if you can put us up on the screen, just the two of us, and have everybody else be non-video participants. Okay. So here we are. So what we would like to do in this little time that we have together is for you to just kind of tell me a little bit about something in the recent time that has upset you or where you felt like you became reactive in a way that was not wanted any kind of situation that you have so there was one very recently this week um which was uh upsetting um and it's so, but it, but very hurtful to me as a as a sexual nine. Right. The intensity of my reaction to his refusal to engage in conversation about it. That right. was the bit for me, not the topic itself. I can go there, but the right. refusal to enter into conversation, right, um, as a reaction was was one I was really um, wounded by. Yeah. So that's the crux, right? I mean, you demonstrated your nineness perfectly by going out there and perfectly being awake and aware to everything that happened for him, everything that happened out there, including sort of owning that you didn't chose maybe the best moment, although there may have never been a best moment when a person is in that field in that time and we've just gone through that with Helen Palmer and David Daniels as being the the icons of something so I understand exactly what you're saying but it takes you a long time to come to your own hurt just notice that yeah you have all this love and care and this understanding for him and you know this is sort of the last little bit you mentioned just notice that yeah I was mm. hurt deeply, mm. almost as a little afterthought. Mm. So just notice that. Where do you feel that inside, that hurt, that he doesn't want to speak to you any longer there? Very yeah. clearly in the heart. Yeah. Um, uh, um, on the day, uh, I felt sick, physically sick, yeah. and it was more at the diaphragm than anywhere. Yeah, but the, but the, uh, yeah, the hurt is carried in the heart. Yeah, and almost numb in the belly. Yeah, yeah. So that is you describing the beauty of the nine, right? I can numb myself to the point to where I don't have to feel myself. Mm. 
-hmm. and my own pain because then i can merge out and stay present with what happens over there so that i will belong now the belonging is severed because he doesn't want to speak to me that is deeply painful the pain of separation is huge for the nine in the heart yeah with the sickness in the in the solar plexus in the stomach yeah and the beauty is that he did exactly what you're the most afraid of and the reason, reason why I say it's the beauty, because that's when the pattern really starts to become really activated to the point to where you can't go along to get along and keep numbing yourself out. Yeah, because what, what I'm very aware of is the, um, the pattern playing out in the anger which goes, when's it my turn? Yeah. So feel that anger. Yeah, and the choking of that, the choking of voice that happens here. Yeah. So this and is the tight, tightening this here. It's a reaction to that, <laughs> right? Just for a moment, feel the anger itself for not having been given a voice. Feel the anger. Where do you feel that? The anger that you don't have a voice. You're not being given a voice. Actually, the voice is taken away from you. I don't know where I feel it, yeah. other than um, it's fierce. Yes. So and I think it is somewhere like shoulders and backbone, I think. Mm -hmm. That's the closest I can get to it. Yeah. So make some space for the fierce anger. And, and actually, sorry, there's also um, a, a fist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, 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 that wants to punch, actually. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. feel the fist. Keep the fist going. Feel the shouldering. Yeah. And now I can see the anger on your face. Let that face be angry for this minute. He's not here. It's okay with me. I can be with anger. I can be with rage. I can be with whatever is there. Yeah. How does that feel? to just allow yourself to feel the sensation of that anger in the fist, in the stomach, in the shoulders, the bones. It feels strong, mm -hmm. solid, and mm -hmm. stuck. Yeah. So how is that to make space for strong, solid, and stuck? It's great, <laughs> actually. Um, yeah, just feel that. It's less fierce and more purposeful. Yes, because you're allowing mm. space for it. It doesn't mm. have to claim you so hard if you make space for it. And you recognize, hey, there's something good in this. Mm. Yes? Mm. And you feel that? Mm. Because something... the intent was pure. Yes. And that's, and that's here. And there's mm. tr truth here. This is my truth. Yeah. Yes, feel that. Yeah. I have a voice, just like everybody else. Yeah. How does that feel? Um, it feels strong and clear but still on the inside and so still not with the clarity of how to move it outside so how to have the expression that releases yeah so it's still a little bit stuck yeah yeah, yeah. but it's clear and it's strong yeah 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 so breathe Breathe around that strength and that clarity inside. Don't worry about outside. You know, the fact that you're staying inside the way you do is already huge for the nine. Yeah. You're not merging with me. You're just staying inside. And gift this to yourself. Receive it with that, that strength and that clarity. 
And what would it be like if you considered for you to allow that strength and that clarity and the energy of that to move inside of yourself, wherever it wants to go? And just breathe with it. Breathe with the movement. Notice where the clarity and the strength wants to move. Still has um still wants to be expressed. Sure. But there's um there's a more but what is happening inside before you consider expressing through words or through movement, what does the inner movement feel like right now to be clear and strong inside? It's almost as though the, um, the boxed container of it has melted away. Yeah. And do you feel it in other places of your body now as it's allowed to move wherever it wants to move and can move? And take a breath into it. Strength. I don't feel it as anger. I feel it as purposeful. Yes. Energy. Yes. So this is the transformation, mm. right? It's not mm. anger anymore. It's purposeful. Mm. So breathe into purposefulness. And let it move and take up every cell of your body if it wants. Just breathe with it. Take some breaths into that. Yeah, how does that feel inside? Calm. Calm. See, here we are. Mm. This is what we were looking for. Now we know that your nervous system has calmed. Yeah. And in that calm, you now can express whatever it is that you would like to say to this person that you have admired, that you have carried you know, equally to yourself and other people, what would you like to say to him from this place? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for caring so much. And thank you for the quality of the work. Uh, but that also, but I also need to find expression to the, and we still need to talk. Yeah. So what would you like to say to him about you not having been able to have access to him, to speak to him? From this place. It's important that we can create space where we can each have voice, that we can seek to understand each other. Right. And we build from a platform of understanding. Yes. Mm. And we're in it together. Mm. How does that feel? When you say that, in the way that you just said that. Um, it feels strong and purposeful and kind. Yes. Um, and clear. Yeah. And, and my head says, and what if he still says no? It's okay. <laughs> See, this is the hard part. What we want is something. You want the connection with him and the belonging. That's a type structure need. Yeah. And it has a tendency to corrupt 
the truth. Yeah, because if you would say this with this in mind, the, I'm saying these things in the way that I'm saying it so that you will want to belong to me again, right? You won't be able to say it, you just said it. You will have an ulterior motive that is, I need something from you, rather than this clarity, this purposefulness, this being fully embodied inside of yourself and feel that wanting in your belly to want to have a certain outcome and relax it. Relax it as much as you can. And notice where that upwelling comes in that says, I want this from you. Yeah, I will say all these things that are kind and all of this, as long as I get something from you. Do you see that it's not clear? It's not clean. It's not strong. So this is the purpose of this work that you get so all through down through these layers that you can slowly learn how to embody yourself with the wisdom and the truth and the clarity and the strength within yourself is to not be invested in the outcome. Because you can go to that little one inside of yourself that wants to belong desperately and has experienced the wound of separation. Yeah. And you breathe around her and you take her with you in that conversation. Anyway, this is a little precursor of a little bit more advanced work, but you, you just beautifully demonstrate it. You know, the dilemma of the nine. Yeah. Can I speak up? Oh, I feel anger. Oh, it can't come from anger because then I risk this. It's going to be a mess. Right. And yet the anger was your salvation as you embodied it inside of yourself and you stayed a little bit away from wanting to i have to express no you first have to create a balance until the calm came and then from that place you can express in a different way and he will hear it differently Yeah, what he's going to do with it, you don't know, but you're giving him all the opportunity to soften with you. Um, I would like that there is going to be a, and I usually lead with this, but I'm doing this in closing of when I work with somebody, I really want everybody to um, have a, a, a vow of confidentiality about this work, that we don't name any names. We don't name, if you know who she works for, it doesn't matter. I want you to not name any names. What you can share is how it affected you. Yeah? There was this process with somebody and I felt this and this and this. When they said something about anger turning into clarity and truth, that was amazing to me. Whatever it is, you can talk about the small aspects of it, but not name any names or, yeah, this is private. This was her willingness to share with us today in the group. And, you know, we do that when we do the panels as well. So can I have a show of hands of confidentiality, please? And the people who are hiding in the background, I hope you're raising your hand. <laughs> Thank you so much. So are there any questions about this piece of process? Anything you would like to share with Karen or Zoe? No, Karen, where are you? You're not in that space anymore. Go oh, there. You're on the other side now. <laughs> there you are. About Karen, you know, to how this affected you. Did you have a felt sense experience while she was sharing? And where did you feel something inside of yourself? Because this is how you learn to turn on that particular lens of perception. Yeah. Anybody?
Yeah, Karen, I want to say without crying too much, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Zoe. Yeah, leave it there. Beautiful. Letting yourself be touched, moved, is what this work is about. Because we're lighting each other's fires. One does a piece of process, it opens it up for the next person. Yeah, mm. if you let yourself be touched. Yes. Who wants to say something? Okay, well, we have kind of come to the end of this little, um, you know, presentation, and hopefully it's a little bit clearer to you. If there is some mystery left, that's okay, too, because that was the intention for you to see that, you know, this is something that you either feel attracted to and know that it's time for you to, to do this work. And if it is, by all means, I am committed to being there in January. And thank you, Elena and Karina, for being our gracious hosts. Thank you. So much. Actually, also, I, I would like to uh, say that uh, when you had this process just now, you said uh, something like, "I can. Uh, you can just show the anger. I can just. I can." be with it or make space for it. And uh, I remember that happened also when uh, I was in Brighton with you and doing module one, two, three. And that's what I think is uh, really amazing with you as a teacher that I want to, I want people to know that um, uh, Marion has this great capacity of being really present and being very caring and loving and still being able to uh, hold the space. And that I think makes it very strong, the work we're doing on the, on the somatic integrum work. Yeah, thank you for that. And it feeds my heart. It brings so much love and joy in my heart to see you know, this beautifulness of that of human beings that arises that it gives me hope and it gives me faith and trust that the world, you know, is evolving. And thank you for participating. Yes. Thank you very much. So do you want to give the specifics maybe of yes, yes, sorry. just being touched by the situation <laughs> but uh, yes of course um well we are so lucky that you're coming to denmark in uh, january the 11th till 16th of january in uh, nestville and as you can see tonight in denmark it's night anyway <laughs> um we have people from the states and from england and from maybe Sweden, I think, and from all around Denmark. And um, that's module one to three. And then in, uh, in May, the 16th till 21st of May, if people want to, uh, they can attend module four to five in Bir Birmingham in, uh, in the UK. So, you don't have to go all the way to the States. I'm going in in a week to meet you in the States because I can't wait. <laughs> but you know, for everyone else, it's actually possible to take the modules one, two, three in Denmark and then go to the States, uh, to the UK afterwards in the spring. Yes. Yeah, and it is, it's really, rare that I do it in person anymore. So I'm trying to get back there. But if you do, if you really want to do this work in person, this is a great opportunity to do that one, two, three, and then follow it up with four and five in Europe. It's a great deal. And, and also I want to say uh, in this event, event that uh, you all 
uh, saw on Facebook, I'll uh, I'll put the links to the January event event and the uh, the if you want to go to Birmingham also I can put some notes there. Okay, That's beautiful. I just want to say, yeah. if I can add this, that I think it's important to say that you can choose to go to Birmingham and take module four and five, but module one to three, <clears throat> you can take that alone. You can take that for your own inner process to do this work and to get the how to do this with yourself, this transformation and this practice with being with the ego and with the presence and all that. And if you want to take it further, you can go and uh, uh, I'm going, <laughs> I'm going in May and, and Helena is going in a week, but, but <clears throat> the module one to three is transformational in itself. Yeah. And four and five is also for self-development. And after that, we do retreats for self-development. And after the mo fifth module, if you are a professional working with people, you can certify also. But that's not necessary. That's sort of only for the people that want to integrate it into their, you know, coaching life, spiritual direction life, or psychotherapy life or whatever whatever if you even if you're a teacher of some sort you might want to bring it into your teaching so thank you all for this wonderful opportunity and uh, wish you a good night and sweet dreams for the people that are in the evenings and have a good rest of your day if you're on the american continent i'll see you soon hopefully thank you very much marion for taking you're so welcome Great. Happy, happy to be here. Bye, everybody. Bye.